be human is denied every day to hundreds of millions of people. Dans ce temple des Nations Unies, nous sommes les gardiens d'un idéal. Nous sommes les gardiens d'une conscience. La lourde responsabilité et l'immense honneur qui sont les nôtres doivent nous conduire à donner la priorité au désarmement dans la paix. Chaque génération, sans doute, se croit vouée à refaire le monde. La mienne sait pourtant qu'elle ne le refera pas. Mais sa tâche est peut-être plus grande. Elle consiste à empêcher que le monde se défasse. So, hey everybody, um, we really have an international moment today because uh, uh, we got um, Risha Kaplan this morning from uh, uh, Oxford and uh, I think he is uh, still with us for now. Uh, and we welcome this afternoon um, Diego uh, from Stockholm, Pamina, Naomi, uh, I think in both West and East Coast or just uh, both in the, um, uh, the West Coast, I'm not sure. Um, and also in the audience, Jania in uh, Brazil with her students. Um, so this afternoon, following on from uh, Richard's lecture this morning, we try to understand what is peace. Uh, I mean, conceptually, uh, during all week and today, but also practically, uh, particularly this afternoon. Um, we have seen there is different level analysis, uh, global, but also and more and more local, it's a famous local term and different methodology. Uh, this afternoon we will be um, this afternoon will be a kind of introduction to quantitative uh, methods um, with different projects. Um, and I know that quantitative studies are very little used in social science in France. Uh, I think this is completely different in the United States, and um, that our students are not very familiar with these methods. So we will split the session uh, in two hours with Diego first presenting on his works and then taking questions and then Pamina and Naomi presenting uh, on their own uh, work. Um, so please Diego, uh, um, welcome Diego Lopez da Silva, which, uh, who is a researcher in the Supreme Armed and uh, Military Expenditure Program. He told a PhD in Peace, Defense and International Security Study from Brazil, from Sao Paulo uh, State University. Uh, it is really a Brazilian afternoon. Uh, <laughs> his current research concerns the interplay between institutions, political transitions, and military spending. Uh, he also published about the international arms trade and arms production. Um, Diego, our students uh, read, read um, your article, Autocracy is on the Rise, Should We Expect Military Spending to Follow? And also your paper about trends in world uh, military expenditure uh, last year. So I hope they are prepared. Uh, <laughs> like this morning, uh, Valentina recalled the link between a peace and democracy um, when she uh, understood the, the, con the conference of, uh, of Richard Kaplan. Uh, so this link, it's uh, the liberal school thesis, uh, actually. Uh, epistemologically speaking, one cannot talk about peace without also questioning war. I think, and conflict. So if at the very least peace is the absence of armed conflict, so the negative definition, we, we would like to understand uh, Diego work and methodology to better understand peace, even if it's not directly your, your, your work. So uh, please, Diego, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanna start off by saying that I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's such an, uh, an interesting event. This morning was really, really interesting with Richard. And um, I look forward to hear more about uh, Naomi and Pamina's research as well, because it looks really, really uh, interesting. Well, uh, as said, my name is Diego Lopez. I'm a, I'm a researcher at CIPRI, which stands for the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, where I work with the military expenditure and arms program. And my, my main goal here today then is to present our work, what we do and why we do it. CIPRI is well, uh, known for our databases. We currently have about four or five databases. Three of them I have worked with. There are two of, there's one about peacekeeping operations and another one about 
the arms trade treaty, uh, the act activities related to the implementation of the ATT. And uh, yeah, so today I'm gonna focus on only one. When I was uh, um, um, designing this, uh, this presentation, I thought that if I present all three, it's gonna be hard to show not only the conceptual side, but also how to use the data and what does it tell us. So uh, let me just share my screen right now and uh, to show my presentation. Um, and here it is. And my main goal then is to discuss how to measure global military expenditure. And let me start my presentation by maybe contextualizing what CIPRI is and where it came from. So um, I wanted to picture the early years, or at least the, the first 20 years of the Cold War. How was the environment back then, right? So we had two poles of power trying to assess each other. And a big part of the, of the Cold War being kept cold was uh, uh, that could, they, they could assess each other in a more accurate way. Because any sort of a, a misperception about each other could lead to a preemptive attack and then the outbreak of, of war. So it was really difficult because at the same time, you would have uh, incentives to uh, portray your military capabilities uh, uh, in a different way. You could, for instance, inflate the numbers to look menacing when it suited, or the other way around, you could deflate your numbers to, to, to look less menacing. So there was a need then to, to create uh, some sort of a database or, or source of information that would be neutral in that sense, that would not support either the Soviet bloc or the Western bloc. So that's when CIPRI was created because there was a very difficult uh, uh, environment because neither the Soviets would trust the figures from the United States or the other way around. So you would need this third party to provide, to be an independent uh, party, not supporting either side, but really supporting the idea of peace. So that's how CIPRI started in 1966 with the, with the goal to provide data analysis and recommendations. Uh, 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 on topics related to conflict, armament, arms control, and disarmament. Of course, nowadays, uh, CIPRI's uh, scope is much broader. We have programs uh, about uh, peacekeeping operations, as I said, climate change. We have uh, another program about the relationship between peace and development. We have another one about emerging technologies. So it's much broader. And Cypri kind of followed this broadening of the international security agenda, right? In the Cold War, very traditional when it comes to focus on the strategic capabilities, but right now it's much, much wider. But of course, we'll still keep that core of traditional uh, security concerns, right? And that's pretty much what I do at Cypri as well with my, my the team that I'm a part of. So this core part of CIPRI, uh, uh, it's carried out by three databases. The core of it, there are three databases. The first one is the arms trade database, where we measure the international flow of we conventional weapons ever since 1950 until the latest year. So it's a very comprehensive database, but we only cover conventional weapons, which is weapon systems such as aircraft, frigates, and so on, not small arms, unfortunately. Of course, there's another really good institution that does that the small arms survey. Uh, we have another database about the arms industry where we, we every year we, we, we build a top 100 of the arms industry in the world, just trying to understand how big this is and the relationship between those companies and the state. And the third database, which is the one I'm gonna talk about a little bit more today, is the military expenditure database where we give data from 19, 1949 uh, until for a few countries from 1949 until the latest year. And the piece that you guys wrote, uh, read, the trends, it's probably from uh, our latest uh, data launch that took place now in, in April, or maybe it was from, from last year. But every year we have a data launch and we write um, not only the, the, the fact sheet on the trends, but CIPRI also comes up with this very, uh, um, that's our flagship publication, which is the CIPRI yearbook. And this we publish ever since 1968. And having all the editions of this is a very interesting thing because in a way, these books, they kind of tell the story of international security and all the events that happened. So it's a very interesting source that I very much encourage the students to go to the library and maybe have a look at see if it's a, if it's a, of your interest. Um, 
So let's go then and focus on the military expenditure database, right? So everything starts with the definition, a reasonable definition of what is military expenditure, because countries will have different conceptions of what it is. I mean, it seems very straightforward to talk about military spending, but it's not that much because you, you don't really, of course, that would be, there, there's a difficulty of defining what is a military related activity and what is not. So what will be included or not. So CIPRI has, has this definition, which includes, of course, the armed forces, but also includes the peacekeeping forces defense ministries, and also other agencies that do anything related to the military, paramilitary forces, and that is uh, a very important one because, for instance, France, uh, uh, for instance, gendarmerie, a part of it, which is a more militarized force, a part of it we also include into France's military spending. Um, and in the in developing, uh, in developing countries, this uh, mid-range military force is very present. Uh, we have military police and, and so on. So sometimes they perform uh, activities that are very much related to, to, to military activities. So we also include those. And military space activities. And of course, uh, uh, we, this definition, the trick of it is that it has to be um, general enough so we can apply that to every country for which we can find information. But at the same time, it cannot be so broad and, and general that it loses all meaning of it, right? So the first thing, I guess, to think about then uh, how to quantify things, right, across many, many countries in many, many years is to think of uh, operational definition of what you want to measure. For instance, the whole discussion this morning was about how do you, would you define peace and how would you measure, right? So these things, they start with this very operational sometimes definition that you lose some, uh, let's call it like more of a conceptual richness for the sake of, you know, trying to operationalize uh, this definition. So with this definition, we collect data for as many countries as we can. So this uh, 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 latest um, data launch, we had, we tried to collect data for 172 countries. Uh, that was the, 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 the new uh, update of our uh, database. And we use open sources mainly. Uh, that's actually, actually, that's our main source. Uh, we, we go look for government budget, budgets, uh, uh, annual budget laws, um, any sort of uh, uh, official statement that would give figures. Sometimes we send questionnaires to, to, um, to governments and they reply sometimes. Uh, but then that's mainly our let's call it methodology, or at least the sources that we, that we have to, to build our data set. Um, so the final data set then, as I said, is a military expenditure database that covers countries from 19, 1949 until the latest year. And we give military spending figures in different units, so to speak. Um, we give, and they all have their own purpose. It, it, it all depends on what you wanna know and what you wanna ask. Right. So we give military spending figures in local currency at current prices. So if you're questioning the, the, the trend just for France of military spending, then maybe you want to have a look at local currency. Or if you want to talk about Argentina's military spending, you would look at the pesos, right? The trend over time for that. Um, this is not a good measure when you try to compare countries because you have different currencies, right? So what we do then is to provide military spending in US dollars and constant prices. So if you want to compare countries, you want to have a common unit to, to compare all of them. So we use, the, we use uh, US dollars, but also we control for inflation, right? So we also do constant prices as well. So if you want to, when you, when you're thinking about all oh, the top 10 uh, military spenders in the world or comparing just, you know, a, a smaller uh, spenders, that's the unit you want to use. We also give uh, military spending as a share of GDP. And this one is a very interesting measure because this is what we call the military burden. We want to know how big is, uh, uh, is your military spending compared to your country's wealth, right? So for instance, just to give you an idea of the burden, right? So Eritrea in 1999 spent 34% of its uh, uh, GDP on its military. It's a poor country. So if you think about that, it's like for every uh, $10 that that country had, 3.4 was devoted to the military. And of course, a government 
uh, has way more uh, uh, activities, right, or sectors to take care than 10, right? So, but even if it had 10, 3.4 of those dollars that we had, $10 to, to allocate 3.4 went to the military alone. So it was a massive burden on the economy of a poor country. Um, and of course, all the, the, the literature about the economic effects of military spending on economic growth, which is vast, um, um, in, the, in, in recent years, it has been converging to the fact that the military burden has a negative effect on military spending, or I'm sorry, military, spend, military burden had a negative effect on economic growth. Uh, there are a few, uh, uh, um, a few, let's say, authors or a certain uh, uh, line of thinking that argue that military spending could help the economy. And often the example that they give is either the United States or some other advanced uh, uh, economy. Uh, but in the but if you take this idea and you apply it to developing countries, this is not really the case. Military spending most uh, times is a, a, a bur heavy burden on the economy that will have a negative effect on economic growth. So that's something for us to think about when discussing uh, uh, reductions in military spending and all the the, the good outcomes that could uh, come out of that. The final measure that we have is military spending as a share of government expenditure. It's very similar to GDP, but now we're talking about expenditure, how you allocate your, your spending, right? Not irrespective of your, your the size of your um, economy. And this measure is really good to think about opportunity costs, right? So to go back to the, the example of Eritrea, so $3.4 out of $10 went to the military. They could argue, look, if we, pay that much to the military, if we allocate that much to the military, we can have even a, a good economic effect. We are creating jobs or we are building weapons and this will have you know, good uh, uh, results when it comes to, the, to innovation, so to speak. So they, they could argue that, okay, so these 3.4 would give us in the future $5, right, in return, in, in this more economic thinking. But of course, you, don't, you, you, you cannot analyze military spending just like that. You have to consider the, the effects of, okay, so if I take $3.4 and I invest in education, right, how much that could uh, uh, give back? Probably even more. So when allocating money to the military, we have also to consider the opportunity cost of the use of that money to some other area. And this measure of as a share of military spending, as a share of government expenditure, gives this idea very, very clearly. So uh, let me just show you a little bit uh, uh, how the data looks. Um, so uh, here we have El Salvador, military spending and military spending as a share of GDP. And we see that there is a really big spike. And here in this case, this is related to the civil war in, in El Salvador from 1979 to 1992. So here it's very clear the costs of, of, of war, of course, this is a very narrow conception of the cost of war. Of course, I'm, I'm ignoring the, you know, something that cannot be quantified, which is the loss of life. But when it comes to the cost, financial costs of war, military spending is a big part of it. And we see that uh, uh, in El Salvador, if I had even the GDP plotted here as well, you would see a very big dip in, in El Salvador's economy. But what is interesting about El Salvador is that after the war ended, you have Prime Minister spending both as a share of GDP and in constant dollars kind of went back to a pre-conflict trend, which was in a way a good thing. But let me show you then the example of Nepal. Nepal wasn't really the case. So this shaded area right here is Nepal's civil war in 1996 to 2006. And you see that after the war, military spending remained high. Right. So this is one of the legacy costs of the war as well, because during the war, Let's say that institutions change and, and political actors can gain more power. So in this case, it could well be the case that the military during the war became more prominent. And after the war ended, it's much harder to reduce military spending if one group has political power like that, being the military. Of course, in the Paul case, you, you would have also to consider the, the, the regional uh, uh, aspect of it, China and India having a big, big role in there. But 
part of, of, of this level of uh, this surplus of the war is, of course, uh, a legacy cost of the war. And considering countries coming out of war in the post-conflict period, this is very consequential, have, uh, having military spending that high, because this is pretty much taking away the money from economic recovery, building infrastructure and so on, to keep it in the military. So that's a very interesting case in a contrast to, to uh, El Salvador. In Argentina, you see also a spike or a few spikes. Uh, and Argentina is a very interesting case because it's not only about conflict. Of course, in the 70s, there was the known as the dirty war the, uh, between the military dictatorship and the, and the, the guerrillas. Uh, but it was what is really interesting about, I'm sorry that is written El Salvador. This is Argentina. I'm very sorry about that. But um, uh, you see that all these blue, these shaded blue periods, um, they are periods that the military was in power. So there is a very strong relationship between political regimes and military spending. There's a big literature on that too, that shows that military spending has a negative relationship with democracy. The more democratic a, a country is, the lower is its military burden. So, and this of course has to do with how responsive institutions are to civil society's preferences, right? In a military dictatorship, you would allocate money to, to the military itself and you don't have to respond. There are no accountability mechanisms to hold the incumbent uh, 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 responsible or accountable for, for its actions. So in the military dictatorship, this is even more uh, pronounced, but in other types of, um, of, uh, of autocracy, there are not uh, uh, military per se, but of course rely to a really big extent on, on the military to rule and to repress dissent, this is also a relationship that we can see. And it doesn't even have to be that clear, the, 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 the distinction between democracy and, and, and autocracy. Countries that are autocratizing can also have an increase in, in military spending. So you see, for example, uh, Brazil and the relationship that Jair Bolsonaro has with the military, it led to increases in military spending as well, mainly not the overall level, but of course the, the share of investments. There's also this relationship between uh, those two. So these, these are trend lines, I'm highlighting a few countries, but I want to perhaps have a look at the data as, as a whole perhaps. So I prepared um, a, a very simple uh, visualization, uh, data visualization here of our data pretty much the, the, the data for, 20, for 2020 that we released recently. And I wanna show two things. I wanna show the global level and how uh, uh, countries, you know, they, they are ranked in this, but also I wanna explore a little bit more this idea of opportunity costs and the preferences of governments, right? When you have high military burden, that's really your priority or not. So this is what I would like to do. So let me uh, shift here. Okay, so here is the, the data for, for 2020, and military expenditure is closer and closer to $2 trillion in 2020. But please bear in mind that 2020 was the first year of the pandemic, right? So to see an increase there, uh, it's an interesting thing. Of course, in 2008, for, for the first year after the financial crisis, we also had an increase, and then the following years was a, was a dip. Um, but in this case, we also see an increase and remains to be seen if the new data will tell us that military spending will start to fall. Uh, but countries can, of course, kind of uh, have a different response to, to this economic downturn than it had for, for uh, uh, 2008. So they may continue to increase in military spending. That's something that remains to be seen. But it's very close to $2 trillion. And just to give you an idea of the opportunity cost again, right? So the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the, the item 4.1, the target 4.1, uh, uh, which is uh, about education, if I'm not mistaken. But I know that the, the UNESCO uh, came up with this estimate in 2015 that uh, from 2015 until 2030, the amount of resources to, uh, um, to, for universal, com universal completion of primary and secondary school education by 2030 for low-income countries. The estimate was around $54 billion. And that's 
a little less than 3% of what is spent in military spending. So a very mere reduction of, of, of uh, uh, less than 3% could release resources that would be enough to reach a very, very important goal uh, uh, for the SDGs or for the whole world for that matter. Um, the second number that I want to show you is the global burden. 2.4% uh, of all the world's wealth is devoted to the military. And this bar chart that I'm showing you right here shows the regional uh, division of, of military spending, where we can see that the Americas has the highest and Asia has the second biggest. Um, but also what I want to show is that military spending is at its highest point since the end of the Cold War, right? So we see that military spending is this has this very uh, uh, um, um, upward trend, especially beginning 2016 again. So it's at the highest level since the, the end of the Cold War, and that really says uh, something. Um, I, now I want to disaggregate this uh, the regions by... By countries, so we understand that it's not really the Americas that has uh, the big, uh, uh, um, the biggest military spending. It's really the United States that has around 34, 39 or forty percent of, of the world's military spending. We have here then China, which is the second one, and uh, and uh, Europe has a quite, let's say, uh, um, well distributed uh, um, uh, military spending among. Uh, Russia, uh, that we include in, in, in Europe, the UK, France, Germany, and Italy. Um, now, I want to explore more than this idea of the preferences and what happened in the first year of the pandemic. So this graph right here, I'll have to explain a little bit, so bear with me, but it, it will say something in the end. So in here, I want to see the changes in military spending uh, uh, and economy and the size of the economy and the GDP for the top 60 largest military spenders in 2020. So what you can see here is the top 60 military spenders and the size of the circle is the how big their military spending is. So you can see, of course, here that this is the United States. That's the biggest one. And that's China. So here we have on the right hand side, right, right here, we have all the countries that have and a positive economic growth in 2020. So that it's only a few, of course, because of the pandemic. On the left-hand side, we had all the we have all the countries that had an economic downturn and a negative economic growth. On the upper side, we have all the countries that increased their military spending, and on the down the the the, the bottom side, we have all the countries that decreased their military spending. So what is interesting here that I want to show you is these countries right here, because these are the countries that increase their military spending while having a negative economic growth. So this is very interesting to show why was that the case, right? So for a few countries, we, we know Morocco, for instance, there was the conflict uh, with the Polisario Front. We have Azerbaijan with Nagorno-Karabakh conflict as well. Hungary is one of those interesting cases, which is an autocratizing country, and that increased military spending quite a lot in 2020, because the whole idea that they had, the economic policy was that they would increase uh, uh, the budget of the military spending to hire more people and curb rising unemployment because of the pandemic. So in that way, it's kind of kind of a, a counter cyclical policy to, to spend their way out the, the economic uh, downturn, but using the military for that. Um, and here, we have other set of interesting cases, which are the countries that look, I had an economic downturn in that year, so I will also reduce military spending. In that set, Chile is very interesting because it's one of the cases where Congress decided to take away money from modernizing their F-16s to co cover the costs of the pandemic. So that is a really interesting case because a few years back, actually two years ago, that Congress could not do this because a law from the military dictatorship uh, kind of shielded the military budget from Congress approval, and the military had uh, 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 liberty, let so to speak, to to buy whatever they 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 wanted. They had they did not have to present uh, uh, um, uh, their purchases or the the costs of arms uh, procurement and maintenance to Congress. So it was a really improvement in democracy in Chile that now Congress has power over this part of the budget, and that allowed them to. Uh, uh, shift resources in a way that was more in tandem with so uh, tandem with civil society's preferences. Now I want to show you another interesting case here in this graph, which is 
China. And China is, is, is a country that one of the big, big spenders that managed to increase uh, 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 their military budget while having a, a growth in, in, in their GDP. And here I want to show you really the trajectory of, of China. We have here a few uh, Asian and Oceanian countries, and I want to show you over time China, the, the, the trajectory and how it responded to uh, uh, economic uh, crisis. So it's a bit fast here, but these two periods right here are periods of economic downturn, of economic crisis, 1997, the, the Asian crisis, and 2009 or 8, uh, the financial crisis. And you see that military spending in China remain untouched in a way. So this, of course, has to do mainly with their economic growth because military spending as a share of GDP remained relatively stable. But of course, with the growth of the Chinese economy, military spending continued to rise. So this graph right here uh, illustrates quite well these discussions about China's rise and increasing military capabilities. Um, so because then most countries uh, increase their military spending while having economic uh, uh, negative economic growth, you see here that the change in military burden between the shares of military spending and GDP, they all increases by quite a lot. So most countries had an increase in their military burden in 2020. You see here that Oman, which is the highest, which is the country with the highest military burden, had a 2.2 percentage points increase. And as a matter of fact, the Middle East was the region that had the biggest increases in military burden. Um, and here, um, and I'm already uh, reaching uh, the, the, the end of my, my, my presentation. Here, it's the final picture, right? So this is a map, a heat map of uh, military as a share of GDP, military burden in 2020, where we can see that Oman, which is, uh, is, the, is the country with the highest military burden in 2020, 11% basically. So again, going back to the example, every $100 uh, of their economy goes to the military. And here, I just want to show you that most countries, this is a histogram, uh, is just showing how many countries spend more or less between 0.5% of their GDP or 2.4. These are most countries spend around, you know, within that range. But of course, we have these outliers, such as uh, Oman, such as Saudi Arabia, and such as uh, uh, Algeria, that have a, a quite large military burden. And just to finalize my, my, my presentation, I, I, I wanted to, to have this quote right here from a report of the Secretary General of the United Nations. It was in celebration of the Resolution 1325 about women and peace and security, where the Secretary General took the opportunity to uh, outline a few goals for the following decade. And one of them was this one, to reverse this upward trend in military spending that I just showed you, and with a view to allocate those resources to fund uh, other social goods, such as health, education, and to really fund all the, 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 the sectors that would enhance human security in a way. And I guess that this quote right here, it synthesizes quite well what we do at CIPRI, which is provide data because the data that it was used in the, in the, in the final report was CIPRI's data. So that's what we do. We try to provide data for this uh, uh, assessment of these global trends. And uh, why we do it is precisely this. We want to really understand uh, uh, the size of the military. So we really measure the, the opportunity costs of militarization and military spending as a whole. Uh, so that will be it. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Diego. Um, this was very a wonderful lecture with, um, which brought us uh, precious insights uh, um, in, uh, on your metals and uh, your work at CIPRI. Um, and uh, it's uh, inspiring for our students, I think. Uh, maybe maybe Pani now and Naomi will share some uh, of uh, the case studies you introduced. And um, as uh, especially for the owner of Africa, I was very happy to hear about Eritrea. <laughs> Sometimes we forget. Um, maybe we have some questions from uh, the room from uh, Alice, Clemence, uh, Clemence, Thomas, Clemence, maybe. Yes. Uh, for, so thank you. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, we have a um, few questions. Um, some maybe uh, more about uh, the studies and the process. 
Um, so how much time does it take to realize a study on military expenditure? Um, so what if uh, uh, during the study, uh, there is a political disturbance in the country on the national level that can change uh, the layout of the study? And we also had a question about um, the security dilemma, if it could be taken into account. And the last one is about uh, the CIPRI fact sheet that you published in April uh, 2021. Uh, so we looked at the table with the 40 countries for the military expenditure in 2020. And we saw that some data are uncertain estimates or CIPRI estimates. And you said that you use um, um, data that you can find, but uh, how do you do this estimation uh, for a country like uh, China? Diego, do you prefer we take some question and then you answer, or you can answer this question first? And can I answer this the stat first? Because there, there were four points. I didn't get the second one. I, I'll, I will answer the, the three, and then perhaps you can repeat, repeat the second one. So the, the time it takes, uh, quite a while. Uh, we are a very small team. Um, so to, to right now, we're involved in keeping two databases, which is the military, military expenditure and the arms um, industry. And we're a team of four. So we have the <clears throat> this core work, but also we have external projects, right? Right now we are finishing a project on post-conflict military spending. We have another one about uh, um, arms production in, in Asia. So we have all these things with a very small, small team. So it's very time consuming because we have to manually look for the, 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 the documents every year. So it's quite time consuming, but right now, since we've been doing this for, for quite a while, um, then we know, we know how to look, we know where to look. Um, so it's, it, of course it gets easier. Uh, we get more efficient with time, but it is, it is time consuming. Uh, about the security dilemma. I mean, it, this is a, uh, this is this is very much related to that because we even the united nations the the efforts at the beginning of of building a transparency uh, uh, mechanism uh because the united states the united states they do have two mechanisms to report uh conventional arms and military expenditure uh, but participation is very very low but the whole driving idea behind that was that look with transparency, we can eliminate these uncertainties between countries. So uh, we, I'm not going to uh, overestimate your military capability and won't, you perhaps won't overestimate mine. And then we can perhaps start from this more accurate assessment from, from that. But um, in a way, the security dilemma is very, very much uh, uh, focused here. Um, and of course, uh, also we can show we can show with this data perhaps the effects of security dilemma as well. If you begin with this spiral of, of, of competition between two parties, you can see the data that we have. It's very useful to see if there is an armed race or not. Of course, the numbers themselves are not enough for you to make an assessment if there is uh, uh, um, an arms race, because sometimes it just correlate for whatever reason. Uh, you would have to certainly have very thorough qualitative assessment but our databases would certainly be a part of the of the of the study, and about estimates, that's uh, that's uh, that's a very important uh, point because there are some countries again within uh, this idea that sometimes they have incentives not to report military spending figures, or sometimes they have an interest to over-report military spending figures. Um, for the estimates, it's almost always the case that they are under-reporting. So I'm gonna give you an example about Venezuela. Venezuela has something called uh, the National Fund for Development, uh, which is an off-budget mechanism, uh, which means that the, the, the funds that are managed by this, by this uh, uh, fund, they do not go uh, into the, the annual budget that is voted, or at least it was voted in, in, in Venezuela. So it's off the books. So we don't really ha have a way to measure this, right? So what we do sometimes is then try to estimate that based on another study that said, look, it's 20% of the oil revenue from that country goes to that fund. So we try to go this way, or in the case of Venezuela, we try to find another source uh, that gives uh, um, information to us. And then we add that to, uh, um, to the overall military spending. But sometimes there is a certain degree of, of um, uncertainty there. 
So we code in a way our figures with black numbers, blue numbers, and red numbers, which is estimates and highly uncertain numbers. So if you're gonna if you're gonna use the database, you know if you want to restrict only to the numbers where we are 100 sure that this is the case, or as close as one can be about uh, certain about these things, uh, you can just restrict your analysis to those to those numbers. Um, I guess there was that. So if you want to repeat the second point um, about an, uh, an event that happens in the in the country, was that it? Was that it? Uh, yes, it's uh, if uh, during the study uh, there is a political disturbance in a country, how this on the national level, how this disturbance is going to affect the study. Yes, so uh, it will affect in a way uh, our next round of. Of uh, of data launch or you know the, the the update because if I'm if I'm collecting data right now uh, this is 2021 and I'm collect for this year we're going to write about the data for 2020 so if something happens this year right uh, I'm I'm still writing or collecting data for the previous year there is a kind of a lag between this so if this event happens and it's related to security or political change in political regimes then it will affect our figures for sure that's something that we will write about in the in the the yearbook and will affect our next round of of um, of data launch and really updating our, our data set um i think alice have the question and toma and then we have two questions in the q a alice um, so actually, we divided. Uh, Clemence would do the questions for uh, Mr. Lopez Silva, and okay. Thomas and I will be for the second part. Okay, great. Uh, so actually, maybe the question the Q and A. Yes. Actually, I will have one question. Please. Uh, because uh, during the presentation, I uh, I saw a country with, which that caught me my caught my attention, and you you showed us a country which is Lebanon, uh, and nowadays the country uh, has drastically reduce uh, its budget, uh, especially uh, in the military sector. And even more, this is even more true due, due, due to the crisis uh, it is going through. But the country uh, is essentially defended by Hezbollah. So for this kind of country where uh, the army, where the army is placed, uh, it's replaced by an entity outside the government, how can you produce an accurate analysis uh, at the risk of uh, of it being based by corruption. Yeah. It's a very yeah. between a quantitative and qualitative. Sure, sure, uh, be sure. careful, he's not specialist of all the country in the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but yeah, no, that's a really, really good question. Um, we all we restrict ourselves to to the official military. Um, sometimes we add this parliamentary force, but if it's really linked to to uh, uh, the government. But uh, that's a really good question. So all we can do in these cases, it's uh, to acknowledge the limitations of our data uh, and uh, say, look, for this country, we, ha we have footnotes in our databases that, you know, will say, look, this country, we're still missing this. And that's something that every year we try to improve, at least for one country or a few, uh, we try to get more data and get ever more accurate when it comes to our, to our figures. But um, in, in those cases, really, when there is another actor that, you know, has a, a prominence in the country, uh, if we don't have figures, then it's really, really hard to, to estimate. And that's something that really, when it comes to the overall cost of, of a war, uh, we're only talking about not only the GDP, but when it comes to the military spending, we're only talking about the military spending of the government. So we're not talking about the military spending of the rebel forces, uh, which is very, very hard, if not impossible to get in a comparative uh, um, uh, way. And sometimes we even may have a figure, let's say for 2019, but if we don't have for all the years going back, at least from when this group started and a comparative thing for all the other countries, we don't include because the database needs to be consistent. And if you add more information for one country or just for one year and you're missing the others, it's not really a good thing because it has to be consistent. Even if sometimes for the sake of, for the sake of consistency, you would have to limit and have and, and have a, a more narrow uh, database. That's sometimes what happens. But um, for the sake of, uh, of, of consistency, we have to make this option sometimes. Thank you. We have two questions uh, in the Q&A uh, from uh, Hali Sami, Sami Hali. Um, hello, sir. Thank you very much for being here. How do you explain the rise of military spending since the early of 2000 when wars are becoming increasingly rare? 
Incre increasingly what? I'm sorry, the last thing? Uh, uh, my accent. Ra. Ha. Oh, okay. Ha. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure if wars are becoming are becoming more uh, rare. Actually, um, like this Intestate, morning. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, in the yes, inter, interstate, you know, internationalized wars, maybe. Uh, but uh, as uh, Richard uh, uh, has shown in uh, this morning, um, this is not really the case. We have a really a peak in the number of, of ongoing conflicts in the world right now, and uh, most of these conflicts, of course, are civil wars. So I think you have two trends right here, which is the United States. There was the, any change in in the, the world uh, uh, figures will really be carried out or driven by the United States and the big spenders, China as well. And China is increasing. So you you, you would have that China, since China is increasing, and the United States may also be increasing. You would have the global overall also increase. It has a big impact. But when it comes to the conflicts, you also have uh, uh, the civil wars, right? So this will, would also affect military spending quite a lot. But maybe the aggregate, because countries in this, most countries in civil wars are not rich countries or poor countries. So comparatively speaking to the big spenders, their military spending has a very little effect on the overall figures, right? But that's not something that we should overlook just because it wouldn't have an effect in global uh, uh, global uh, uh, levels. That's something that sometimes, you know, in the debates about reduction in military spending that, you know, the, the UN car carry out, um, uh, sometimes they focus too much on the global. But I mean, if you take a cut like Eritrea, um, again, uh, it, Eritrea won't have a big, a big effect on the, the global military spending, but a 30% or a 34% uh, uh, as a share of GDP for the people that live in, in Eritrea, that's a big thing. So we also need to consider not only the, the global level, but also what happens in, in nationalized contexts as well. Thank you. Um, last question from um, Alice Legourguez. Legourguez. Les um, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. I was wondering, once uh, the study of measuring global military sparing, spending is done, and the members are established, is the CIPRI also make a conclusion such as this country spend more in the military field in order to protect themselves from a potential danger, or um, they spend more because they plan to participate in more international actions? Um, that's, a, that's a good question because um, it really comes down to what we as CIPRI can say about about the countries, right? So we really refrain from um, writing anything that would take sides um, because we want to be this uh, independent and uh, uh, source of information. So CIPRI sometimes even hosts talks between, between parties. Um, so we really want to keep this independence uh, uh, really uh, protected. So in a way that we sometimes portray um, uh, conflicts and the driving forces behind it are spending. That's a very complicated thing to, to put, because sometimes if you say Taiwan or if you say um, something that is really a contested issue in international relations, that's something that is very tricky for us to do, to, to write and to, to do the analysis. So we go uh, in a case-by-case case by case scenario, but we, we always with this principle uh, guiding us that we should not in our writing take really... Uh, um, uh, a big side of, of one or another. But of course, again, the tricky part is, in a way, we are a peace research institute as well. So, of course, we cannot, uh, uh, by being neutral, being silent for anything that is you know, horrendous happening. So uh, it's always a, um, a complicated thing to navigate for us. Uh, yeah. Um, we have another question. Uh, some, okay, I don't know the question. Uh, Felipe Garderon Valencia. Can you open your micro? Uh, hello. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I just want to ask about uh, the case of Colombia because we heard uh, uh, from the uh, exposition of, of Diego that all the country are spending a lot of money on, on military and, and arms and weapons and all that. But the case of Colombia is very special because uh, it's just not the military spending, but uh, uh, really old and great co uh, conflict. 
uh, that we live here, and and I want to know the the opinion of the ex, 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 uh, of, uh, of Diego about the Colombian case, uh, and, and, and overall uh, about the data that he gathered uh, to analyze that case. Thank you. And I think you can uh, ask the same, almost the same question to Pamina and Naomi just after, because we will also talk about Colombia. Please, Diego. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, thank you, Felipe. Uh, not sure if I if I quite understood. Um, so you want me to discuss about the military spending in in, in Colombia, right? Um, is, if I understood correctly, or the economic effect? Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much that I asked. Thank you. Maybe okay. sorry to intervene, but maybe also talk. Can you talk a little bit about police? Um, and the role of the police and the support of the police, if that's something that you measure, be interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Um, yeah, so the, the case of Venezuela, the case of, um, of Colombia is one that is really interesting because for us is the military aid as well that Colombia receives from the, the United States. Military spending there, of course, has a cost on, on the economy. I'm not aware of any study, this is because this is quite common in the, in the, in the literature about the relationship between military spending and economic growth in Colombia uh, um, alone. Um, of course, there are for Latin America, but not about Colombia. Um, but for, for Colombia, a large part of what is spent is, uh, is uh, um, by the United States that you know just give gives the, the aids through various uh, uh, through various channels. Um, for us, um, and this is something that perhaps is something that uh, we can even discuss, is that CIPRI does, and for quite a long time, includes the expenses and the cost of military aid uh, into the calculations of the donor country and not the receive, the recipient country. So in a way, it, show, it, may, it kind of inflates more the United States military spending and not Colombia's military spending, which is way more than is uh, uh, um, uh, reported in their in their budgets, right? So, for CIPRI's figures, uh, unfortunately, if you only take Colombia, that is an underestimate of what is spent uh, uh, in that conflict because we add that to to the United States, and um, that's something that can even be be that's something that we have we have discussed among ourselves if that that makes sense or not. Um, but as always, a, uh, there's always a trade off uh, when it comes to police. Um, for Colombia, I'm not quite sure if I, if I recall that we add paramilitary forces. In the case of Colombia, the, the military is quite um, uh, involved in, in, uh, in you know, police operations. So we include the military that is involved in that, not the police itself, at least for, for Colombia. Um, in Mexico, for instance, the fight against the drug, cart drug cartels is a driving force of military spending. Uh, they have a new force uh, a new police force right now that we understand is militarized enough to be included as, uh, which is the uh, the National Guard uh, that was created recently, I think in 2019. So in that case, we include this paramilitary force uh, in our calculations of military spending. For Colombia, we only include the military, but not the 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 police itself. Yeah. Thank you so much, Diego. Um, please stay here because I think we will have all the questions after we have Pamina and how we are uh, intervention. Um, and I think Pamina and uh, Naomi will share your um, your focus. Uh, don't focus too much on the global. <laughs> this is the conclusion. But I think they will share uh, the same conclusion. Um, so I'm very happy also to um, um, to introduce Pamina Fircho and Naomi uh, Levy. Um, and I'm very happy they have accepted our invitation. Um, I discovered their work uh, during the International Studies Association uh, Annual Congress last year. Uh, and I say to Valentina, okay, this is a project our students have to know. <laughs> this is really important. And um, from uh, Las Vegas, uh, uh, we should be in Las Vegas, from Las Vegas to Lille in the north of France, uh, we never met uh, in real, <laughs> just indirectly and, uh, and uh, with Zoom. So uh, I hope be maybe be after the pandemic, it will be uh, possible to work together. Um, Pamina Fischel is an associate professor of coexistence and conflict at Brandeis University. Elo School for Social Policy, 
Her main research interests surround the study of the international accompaniment of communities affected uh, by mass violence. Uh, Pamina's uh, work um, engages collaborative approaches to mixed uh, methods, uh, measurement through an inclusive and participatory methodology, and she called develop uh, what uh, she called uh, the everyday peace indicators um, that she will introduce today to her students. Um, and now Milivi is also an associate professor of political science at Santa Clara University. Uh, we have a very important question is to know, are you both in the West Coast or East and Baltimore? You will answer after. Uh, and um, she is a member of the Everyday Peace Indicators uh, Board of Directors and her research centers on the relations, uh, relationships uh, between ordinary, ordinary sorry, uh, citizens and the state, with a particular focus on past conflict context. And uh, Naomi uh, worked ask on um, all individuals' understandings of their various political identities are shaped by the state's delivery of public services. And in turn, all these understandings affect intergroup dynamics and state legitimacy. And she also includes methodological questions as part of her scholarly pursuit. And this is a point very important for us today. So thanks to be here with us. Thanks to share your work with us. And I give you the floor. Hello, um, I'm Pamina Fersho. As, uh... Sonia just did a wonderful introduction, but I thought um, I would just quickly introduce myself um, and allow Naomi, uh, Professor Levy, to also introduce herself um, before we start the presentation, since um, we're, I'm going to start with the presentation introducing Everyday Peace Indicators, and then um, Professor Levy is going to uh, continue by um, illustrating a, a case study. Um, so I'm Pamina Fersho. Um, I'm, uh, as Sonia said, an associate professor at the Heller School for Social Policy, where we have a master's program in uh, coexistence and conflict resolution, which is essentially peace and conflict studies, um, a little bit different from security studies. Um, and I'm also the CEO or director of the Everyday Peace Indicators NGO. Um, Naomi, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm Naomi Levy. I'm a professor of political uh, science at Santa Clara University. I'm sort of kind of waking up. I'm, it's the West Coast here and, and the sun isn't even out yet. Um, so uh, excuse me if I, if I can't quite find my words today, um, but I, um, I teach largely research methods uh, Courses and I the, these methodological questions are near and dear to my heart and um, I was I was so pleased to hear uh, Diego's conclusion that that military spending saps the social spending and 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 I think that our data really can show uh, at, at a more fine grain level exactly what that looks like on the ground so I, I think that there's quite a bit of complementarity here in our in our presentations um, I've I've been privileged to work on the Everyday Peace Indicators project for a few years now after having discovered Pamina at an ISA conference and being similarly blown away by this work. So um, I, I've been very lucky to, to join her in this research and, and I'm a member of the board of directors of, of the Everyday Peace Indicators NGO. I'll let you take it over now, Pamina. Thanks, Naomi. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, um, EPI, Everyday Peace Indicators, um, is an academic um, scholarly methodology um, that I uh, developed with um, my colleague Roger McGinty at Durham University. But um, as you may suspect, since Naomi just said that she's on the board, it's also um, now an NGO. It's a um, 501c3 NGO based um, in the US. And we established, were established in 2018. Um, so we engage with many of the challenges related um, to the measurement of peace um, or peace related concepts, um, in particular at the local level, um, both in peace building practice and advocacy. Um, 
So in terms of practice and advocacy, we engage a lot with actors in the monitoring and evaluation space. Um, but we also um, engage with academic work um, and use the a methodology uh, to do research and to um, look in more depth at theoretical questions, as well as questions about concept formation and definition. Um, so I just want to caveat this talk with um, and the um, the caveat essentially that we are not your um, typical or traditional quantitative approach to measurement. Um, and so um, in a lot of ways, we are a response to some of the concerns raised by um, scholars, in particular interpretivist scholars, about um, about positivist um, ways of, of uh, measuring, measuring peace and peace-related concepts. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in, in a moment, but I mean, I uh, just, you know, I, I was unable to hear all of Diego's um, um, presentation, but when um, at the beginning, um, he mentioned that researchers are really trying to measure uh, the p researchers that try to measure things quantitatively need to make decisions about, <clears throat> excuse me, what those co social concepts mean. What we're really doing is trying to engage that and, and take it, maybe push it a little bit further and say, you know, um, is it possible to also include people um, who we're trying to say something about um, in that process of definition? <clears throat> um, so uh, one of the um, challenges of measuring peace is that there are mu multiple dimensions of peace, especially if you look at peace from both a positive as well as a negative perspective. Um, so if you're looking at peace as just the absence of violence, it can also still be somewhat complicated sometimes to measure peace. Um, I mean, as we just saw this uh, question of, of whether or not Steven Pinker is right and we actually um, have less wars today uh, is, is one that's still somewhat up for debate, right? Um, um, but definitely when we talk about positive peace and we talk about um, the elimination of structural violence, there's much more um, uncertainty surrounding what exactly that means um, in different places, right? And so, um, Every, as I said, everyday peace indicators is really a response um, to that concern. And, um, and we, uh, we argue that, um, uh, that in order to find better ways to measure um, peace or difficult to define social concepts, um, uh, difficult to pin down social concepts because they may often be contextual, um, is it's necessary to include beneficiaries, it's necessary to include communities um, that are actually living what we're trying to measure. Um, so in the case of peace, I'm gonna use peace as an example, I mean, as a concept, conceptual example, um, it's peace is something that is often very contextualized and can be highly politicized. And so, um, you know, thinking about having externals come in and impose an outsider definition can often be problematic when we're trying to, to really determine whether or not um, um, things are improving. Um, and so, I mean, we um, are doing something new in the sense that we're um, capturing indicators um, and this is a system systematic process. Um, but it's not new in the sense that we're creating new indicators, because what we're really doing is we're, um, we're, we're capturing indicators of, um, that people already use in their daily lives, right? Indicators that are signs um, that we look to in our daily life to determine whether we are more or less at peace. And really that can be anywhere, that can be in uh, France, it can be in the United States, it can be in war-torn uh, contexts. Um, with the, what's new um, and I guess novel about what we do is that we systematically collect this using a, um, a four-step process, which I'm gonna go over quickly. Um, and again, um, you know, we're, we, we use this to not just um, always define peace, but also other concepts. Um, and 
and, and as I mentioned before, what we're really trying to do, especially academically, is um, is, is bridge um, epistemological and methodological divisions in the social science, sciences. And so, I mean, really what we're, what we're trying to do here is um, bring uh, interpretivists and positivists closer together. Um, I know that this is a bit um, extreme, right? Black and white, there's much gray in between um, and many mixed methods approaches. Um, but what we are looking at is um, really um, taking the concerns of interpretivists about measurement and about external decision making um, uh, on uh, concepts that are um, experienced and socially lived. Um, and at the same try time, trying to respond um, to positivist approaches and um, needs for um, measurement, I mean, sorry, definition and structure um, and decision-making about um, uh, what Sart Sartori calls the conceptual data container. Okay, uh, so as I said, I'm going to um, be going over the steps before Naomi um, uh, gives us an example of, uh, the, of, of some of the things that we're thinking about and an example of an application of how we apply everyday peace indicators or how we've applied everyday peace indicators to answer some of our own scholarly questions. Um, but before I do that, um, uh, I, I wanna stress that when we work, we work very locally. So we don't really capture indicators for a country or even for a city. Um, what we have found is that um, our indicators are um, very much geographic. They're very much tied to people's everyday lives, right? To their everyday experiences, um, to their um um, to, to their work, to their home, um, to their um, neighborhoods. And so therefore, uh, our level of analysis and where we do this work is at the village or neighborhood level. Um, and, when, and when we apply the methodology, we um, oftentimes talk about community. But the first step in doing any project is determining what that community means and whether that community is defined by an administrative unit that is determined by a government or whether that community is defined by the people that live in the place where we're collecting the data. Um, and also, uh, uh, just before I continue and go over the steps, um, Everyday Peace Indicators is part of also a, a broader field of what's called participatory numbers or participatory statistics um, that is an extension of um, participatory research uh, that um, um, includes people in not just, uh, not just as data sources or subjects, but in the process of determining how we um, create uh, statistics or how we create numbers. Um, and so uh, everyday peace indicators is one methodology um, as part of this larger field of participatory numbers. Okay, so I had talked about this four step pro process. We start with um, indicator generation, um, then we go on to verification, um, and then um, uh, we do a design planning and analysis through coding and categorizing. And finally, uh, we use the indicators for surveys. So the first step is um, conducting focus groups. We, um, can, we generate the indicators and discussions um, with community members. Typically when we um, come into a community, we uh, conduct three focus groups depending on the cultural context, sometimes four, uh, one with women, one with uh, men, one with youth. Um, and in the, and those um, conversations are really a starting point uh, where we begin asking a very simple question, which is, you know, what does peace mean in your community? Um, but we then um, begin to probe further um, in order to really um, get at those 
indicators, those signs. And so uh, we use a mixture of different kinds of questions to get at um, the indicators. And um, it really, it seems simple, um, but it is beguilingly simple because it is very difficult. Um, and facilitators need to be very skilled to get at the very, very detailed indicators, which is really the strength of the everyday peace indicators, is, is are the detailed indicators that can really tell a narrative of um, the situation um, and, um, and, and the conceptualization of what peace means in a community. And so we'll ask questions like, you know, what are the signs that you look to in your um, community to determine whether you are more or less at peace? Um, and uh, and use, use prompts in order to probe further and get more information. Once those conversations are complete, um, our facilitators then um, generate lists based off of those conversations, lists of indicators that they have gleaned from the discussions. And then those lists are, um, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> those lists are then uh, verified, what we call verified in another session. Um, and in that session, um, we go through those discussions and ask clarifying questions of participants um, in, because um, it's in, enormously important for us um, to not make decisions about the indicators that they have offered us. So we don't want to translate those lists and then just create indicators based off of our understanding. So we want to confirm and clarify. And that's what the verification process is about. And then we go on to the voting. And in the voting process, we invite the community members, um, more community members um, to, uh, and I can talk about the details of how we select, et cetera, in the q and if that's of interest. Um, but uh, we then invite more community members to um, select um, the indicators that are most representative of their community. Typically, we give everyone 15 votes um, and through a process um, that you can read about on our website, um, community members then uh, choose the indicators that they um, individually feel are most representative of their community. So right now you're probably wondering what do some of those indicators look like? Oops, somehow my slides keep going ahead too quickly. Um, so here are some examples. I chose these relatively um, at will, um, but uh, these are from Afghanistan. So we've, we've uh, worked in many different um, communities in different countries. Um, and I choose these just because they demonstrate how diverse they are, right? Um, we're, you know, there are really indicators from all kinds of different um, parts of people's lives that also represent many different kinds of um, dimensions um, and, and categories or policy needs, right? Um, and the uh, antennas on rooftops one is that I, one that I often like to um, illustrate as an example um, because it's one that I would have never have thought of from the outside. Um, so antennas on rooftops was this was um, one uh, where we were asking people for indicators of violent extremism and um, and so uh, villagers um, explained to us that when they um, approached a new village, um, they would look at look for antennas on rooftops to be able to tell them how much Taliban presence um, or a rebel group presence was in a, a community um, because of course um, the Taliban in particular restricts um, uh, TV or, um, or radio. And so, for example, if they saw lots of satellite dishes, you know, that would mean that there was less presence of armed actors. Um, whereas if there was, um, more, uh, as, as if, uh, if there were, you know, maybe just, um, radio or, um, radio antennas, um, there was a little bit more. And if there was nothing there, you know, it was a completely Taliban controlled village. Um, so that was a really interesting um, indicator to me because it's something, it's an indicator to me that um, illustrates how oftentimes um, there are indicators that really can only come from communities because an outsider would never necessarily think of, think of something like that. 
Um, I use these Sri Lanka ones as an example sometimes just to also demonstrate um, the specificity. Um, and this is particularly interesting often for practitioners because um, you can see how the indicators can really identify specific issue areas and um, you know, name them um, of, of, um, of concerns within the community. Um, and so that's what I mean by um, it being relatively beguilingly simple, the facilitation process, because we really do try to get at um, this um, level of detail um, that um, provides richness and provides also much more context um, than a more generalized indicator. Um, so once we... Um, have these lists. So once we have what we call the final lists of indicators, we then um, go on to um, categorize those indicators for then further analysis to um, either analyze for academic purposes um, or to help us um, provide guidance to programming. Um, we do that through a coding process where we categorize indicators um, and we uh, code them. So I know this is in Spanish. Um, we need to change this example to English. Um, but uh, this is just an example of how we have uh, chosen a community, its indicators, and then um, how we um, create subcodes as well or subcategories as well as categories, and then finally have dimensions. And here are examples of some of the examples of our dimensions. The idea being that um, we create code books specific to each project and context where we're working um, because there are going to be different kinds of indicators in different kinds of places that may not be present in others. So categories may be relevant in some places and not in others. Um, and also the definitions of the categories may be different. Um, as well as the examples, of course. And, um, and so some of our code books are available on, on our website, so you can take a look at those. Um, but of course, the challenge, you know, I mean, just like um, the challenge with the indicators themselves, you can't compare them across communities directly. Um, so we are categorizing in order to be able to compare across communities. Um, the uh, if, if you create different code, code books um, and you have different categories across projects, you can't compare across projects. So we've also created um, dimensions, and the dimensions we um, uh, have we keep constant across projects, so that eventually, as we continue to do more and more work, um, we're going to be able to. Um, to be to compare um, indicators from say California and Afghanistan and Colombia, um, and um, and so uh, these are just examples of of um, of categories and dimensions that we use um, in our code books. I'm going to speed through this just because to give Naomi some time. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the survey because. Um, Naomi is going to be talking about a different survey that we're um, project that we're doing right now. So not to confuse you too much, but essentially, normally in a project, we um, we then plug those indicators um, into a survey, and then um, have respondents um, answer. Uh, in the communities themselves on a Likert scale. Um, and the results then allow us, if we do a baseline and then um, uh, longitudinal surveys, to track change over time. Um, and just to finish by saying that we're working in um, a lot of different contexts and have worked in a lot of different contexts. This gives you an idea of the different places that we're working. Um, and as I said, we are we also work different concepts. It's not just peace, right? So um, we, uh, I mean, you know, most of the cons most of the places that we work are conflict affected, um, and or, or armed conflict affected. But not all of them. Um, all of them are conflict affected. But then again, everywhere is conflict affected. Um, and but our concepts that we work are related to um, peace. So peace, justice, coexistence, reconciliation security, safety, um, violent extremism. Uh, we work a lot 
in Colombia. Um, we have a large project in Sri Lanka. Um, we're just starting a project in um, Bosnia and Herzegovina in Mostar, in the city of, of Mostar. We're also doing a really fascinating project in California that Naomi is leaving, leading, but unfortunately won't be presenting today um, on safety and security in, in California. Um, so, uh, so, so, um, our work really engages both um, our academic curiosities um, about these concepts and the literature surrounding them and how local people respond and engage with, um, um, with, with the studies that we've done primarily from the top down, quantitatively at least, um, as well as um, engaging actual uh, peace building actors and trying to help them respond to community needs more effectively, but still speak to donors in a, in a more efficient manner. So you can learn more on our website and I'm gonna hand it over now to Naomi. Thank you. Um, can you all see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to be brief because I want to make sure to leave plenty of time for, for the questions and answers. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about here is a, um, is a project that is an offshoot and a growth of, uh, out of the work that we've done um, already in Everyday Peace Indicators. And really the question that we're trying to answer with this particular project is whether we can scale the work that we do at this highly localized um, context specific level to, uh, uh, to a higher level of analysis in order to potentially make them more um, complementary to the top down um, types of measurement approaches. Um, and so really what we're asking is a question of whether or not our everyday peace indicators methodology can be scalable, right? So, so our research question with this particular project is, can we scale up these highly localized indicators? Um, or is the utility of everyday peace indicators really limited to, to the local level? Um, and if we if we can scale it up, how do we do that, right? Is there a way for us to establish a methodology by which locally sourced indicators can be used in a wider set of communities? Um, and if we are able to do this, what would that tell us? And, and how could we use them? And would they then be more comparable to top-down indices? Um, and the way that we're doing this is in a project in southwestern Colombia um, with an indigenous group um, called the Pasto Indigenous Group. And we were approached by a group of women leaders of, of a number of different um, indigenous groups in Colombia asking for help in creating a participatory um, bottom-up barometer of peace. Um, and, and we worked in collaboration with a local NGO based in Bogota um, called Siase. Um, and so working specifically with the Pasto, who, who are spread are throughout um, two different departments, largely in the Mourinho department, but also in Putumayo, um, we, um, and, and they live in, in a combination of, of, of more um, uh, um, isolated sort of uh, reservations, they refer to them as resguardos, but also in some, in some more mixed communities. Um, and so what we decided to do was to start by doing our regular everyday peace indicators process in five different resguardos. Um, and, and in this next slide, you can see um, sort of the way that we went about trying to choose those resguardos that we worked with was using a most different design. And the idea here was to try to select five communities that are quite different from each other, um, source a lot of indicators, and then work from there to try to build up to some sort of a scalable uh, um, barometer of peace that come from these locally sourced indicators. Um, so using um, a variety of different uh, variables such as um, levels of violence, amounts of intervention, um, demographic information, socioeconomic inf information and such, we chose five um, resguardos um, that, that were all quite different from each other. And we carried out a full everyday peace indicator process with all the focus groups and the verification meetings and all of that that, that Pimena has already described. But then from there, we varied where we were going because what we're trying to do is build a bottom-up barometer for all the pasto. Um, and so when we did our, our, this is my really bad clip art, but um, when, when we did our, um, our, uh, 
indicator sourcing, we from these five communities ended up with almost a thousand indicators. And clearly you can't build up a build a bottom-up barometer piece asking people to answer questions on a thousand different indicators. And so then we um, we found ourselves in a situation where we needed to do a, a lot of data reduction and, and selecting really carefully from amongst those indicators which indicators would end up on the eventual barometer, which we're estimating will be about 20. And I should note this is a work in progress that was put on hold because of the pandemic. And so I'll just explain uh, where we are in this process. So what we're trying to work towards is having a barometer that comes from the pasto piece people themselves to be used across all the different um, uh, pasto. But we don't want to assume that the um, indicator source from one community would apply throughout the region. Um, so we realize that we have to make selection of our indicators on, 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 based on criteria. And so one of the criteria that we use is how important those themes or those um, categories are to each of the communities. And that was through that indicator verification process where people vote on the indicators. Um, and the other has to do with commonality, which themes run across multiple very different communities. Um, and so to do this process, we started on the commonality side, using that coding description that, that Pamina already sort of provided, we coded each indicator for up to two codes. Um, and then once we had them all coded, we pulled together a data set um, where we would look at one set of codes at a time. So for example, um, everyday conflicts, right? Um, and we would look at a set of 30 to 100 indicators and four, a, a team of four coders would go through all of the indicators that had to do with something like every, um, everyday conflicts um, and, and look for themes that ran across them. And we also color coded them so that we could tell which villages there, which reservoirs they were coming from. So this is an example in English now of all the indicators in the everyday conflicts that had to do with the, had the theme of resolution. So in, in the initial coding, it was deductive in this Second round of thematic coding, it was more inductive where we all sort of looked through them and said, okay, it seems like there's this set of, of, of themes and th that set of themes. And then we discussed together. And then once we sort of saw, okay, I don't know how well you can see that there's four different communities out of the five that all had everyday conflicts uh, codes have or indicators having to do with resolution. And after, after saying that, okay, yes, we need an indicator that says something about res re resolution, we would pick one, this is the one that's in red, that would be the, the indicator that was, was representative of this theme across multiple communities. And, and in order to, to select a theme, it had to appear in at least three of the five communities. And once we finish that, we had 56 different indicators that we wanted to use, but we needed to get it down even beyond that. And so next we turn to the commonality question. And here I'm gonna remind you of our six dimensions um, just to show you how we did this, but we didn't do this at the dimension level, we did this at the code level, but we looked at how important each community found, um, it, use, using those important scores from the, the voting, each of the different categories, and then we chose from amongst the 56 down to 40 to try to get um, a, 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 the right balance of importance in the different categories. So this is a one quick chart to sort of give you a visualization of this, where you can see these are the, these are the indicators that we selected. And this is the overall importance across all 965 indicators across all of the different communities, but this is disaggregated by community. Um, so you can see that there's some big differences community by community, but overall the 40 indicators that we ended up selecting um, match where importance gets placed largely um, across the different dimensions. I'm speeding through this. Our next step is to do a survey um, across all of the pasto communities where we ask them sort of like mimicking the indicator verification group but only presenting for those 40 selected indicators and we're going to ask them on a five point scale how useful they find that indicator to, to gauge how much peace there is in their community um, and then from from there we'll be able to narrow to the 20 most useful indicators for inclusion in the barometer for all of the pasto um, 
But that survey is currently on hold until, until we can do the research um, uh, given, given the pandemic. Um, so I'll stop here, but leave just a few questions that, that are still very much in the mix. Um, you know, is it possible to do this even, you know, this complex question of is this a useful indicator in a survey or not? Um, is there a problem in that we've sourced all these indicators before the pandemic and everything got put on hold and are they still relevant after the pandemic? Um, once we, if, if we answer all those other questions, um, will we be able to build a barometer that gives us a regional measure of peace that allows for cross community and over time comparisons, or are these really highly localized indicators problematic? Um, and then also how will these barometers compare to existing indicators that in indices that, that are being used? So I will stop there and um, take questions. Sorry for going so long. Thank you so much. I was losing because I think that uh, your uh, remaining question are some of the questions our students have for you. <laughs> so I are, they are panicking. <laughs> um, thank you so much because it's really a complete, a complete and fascinating uh, words. Um, and I know that um, our students will also ask questions uh, tomorrow during the uh, Sahel and Malian uh, roundtable about your indicators and peace in the Sahel. I'm pretty sure they're a link because it's a uh, French uh, spoken countries and I don't think so you work on this kind of countries, but uh, I think they really have a link. Um, maybe Clemence, Thomas, uh, Alice, do you have uh, some questions and maybe also a question from uh, the audience? Uh, if you are Q&A, uh, you can ask, please. Thomas, Clemence, Alice. Uh, yes, I will start. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much to all three speakers uh, today uh, for the session. It was uh, really interesting to have um, all of your point of views and see uh, how the like, quantitative methods are um, used today. And so I ha actually have three questions um, for both um, uh, Professor Levy and Professor um, uh, Fearshow. So you, can, uh, so you can answer whenever uh, you want. So my first question would be uh, concerning um, the Columbia project. Uh, as uh, you put different groups uh, to get uh, people for the indicators, uh, and we were wondering how the, the gender, the age, or even the experience of people in the community, because uh, even in, in, the, in the same village, people can have different experiences. So how would uh, this impact um, their perception of the indicators that they create. Uh, my second question would be on the interview uh, conducting uh, with the groups, because sometimes if you go in a, in a country where you don't speak the language, um, there can be a bias first uh, with a language barrier, or if there is a local uh, interlocutor like an NGO or, um, someone, or someone who will help you conduct the indicators, because uh, notions can be different. The notion of peace, of peace itself is difficult to define. And so uh, how do you go through this kind of challenges? And my third question uh, would be regarding Afghanistan. Uh, as you said that you worked uh, in Afghanistan and you already set uh, indicators, uh, we, weren't, we were wondering if the, those indicators would still apply today and how do you think they would actually change uh, with the current situation in Kabul? Thank you very much. Uh, do you need time to prepare and we take all the questions and do you want to answer to this first question? No, I, I, think, I think I'll answer um, and then we can move on. Um, there's plenty of questions <laughs> to address. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Um, okay, so, um, so, so I, actually, I actually think that um, that your your first question and the last question are similar, or at least I'm going to answer them similarly. Um, so, I mean, uh, although I think if I understand your first question um, uh, correctly, um, what you're asking is um, how does how do individual experiences impact the indicators and. I mean, um, this is a majority rules process, right? And that um, can often be problematic, especially in communities in conflict. And so, um, so, so in particular, um, in places where um, there's ethnic tensions, we um, 
which we, we do the process with one ethnic group, for example, right? Um, and and so, so the, the, the process um, allows us to get at um, the, the majority um, conceptualizations and understandings and issues um, that are, and, and at the same time, um, we also make an effort to really within that um, group that we're working with, have um, a diverse representation of voices. Um, so of course, in the selection process, um, we uh, try to ensure that there are different um, sectors of the community represented and that we're not just talking to leaders. I think that's also a really critical point. We, um, we ensure that we're not, you know, we're not just kind of gathering a group of leaders who have, may have um, a particular party line um, and a, agenda um, and, and, and so that we can really try to have a diversity of perspectives. Um, but I think that question also speaks to your last question about whether in yeah. Afghanistan. Before, before you go on to, to answering the Afghanistan yeah. question, I just want to add something here, just on just in a methodological uh, approach of focus groups and, and, the, and the reason why we divide between adult men and adult women and sometimes even um, female and male youth, if, if, if the context sort of requires that. Um, and part of that is because um, for people who have who have um, who are considering doing focus group work in the future, um, it's really important when doing focus groups to have some kind of homogeneity in your group um, because it allows for deeper conversations, right? So, for example, in the Pasto data, there are a, an enormous number of indicators that came largely from the female focus groups about questions that relate to domestic violence. Um, and you wouldn't have that come up if you have a mixed focus group. So, so one of the ways to, to, that we account for, for the kinds of divisions that uh, Alice was asking about is by making sure that there is, um, we make the space in the focus groups for those sorts of indicators to arise. Sorry for jumping in, but I'm gonna let you take it over now. Mina. Yeah, yeah. No, and um, I guess the question of, you know, and it's not just in Afghanistan, but, you know, all of the indicators, do they still apply? Um, and, 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 I mean, also, if a community experiences different experiences, right, if they, if um, time passes, and um, a global pandemic happens, or um, or a coup, or political violence, or various different events. How does that affect the uh, indicators, and do they still apply today? Um, and I, and and I think that's um, that's a really good question, and it's one that we get a lot. Um, and that I think that any kind of measurement system um, trying to measure social concepts should get, right? Um, not just one that is participatory, but also one that is top down because, you know, indicators um, change over time just as, and they should, um, just as social processes change, right? So like, for example, um, there are, um, there's a reconciliation barometer in South Africa um, that started in 2003. And um, by, you know, 2013, they had to revisit their indicators because the social situation had changed significantly in South Africa. Um, and, and, and so that, um, so any kind of indicator, you know, needs to be revisited, I guess is my point. Um, and so for us as well, um, this is a really interesting question um, that we're, mainly um, beginning to tackle now. Um, we're going to be doing another round of indicator collection in Colombia um, after the pandemic. Um, we're also going to be doing another um, indicator uh, round of collect uh, round of indicator collection in Sri Lanka after not only the pandemic but also a coup and a terrorist attack. Um, and in order to really more systematically um, see the difference between the indicators um, uh, pre and post a major event. We have done it in the past. Um, we did uh, revisit indicators um, in uh, our um, initial pilot communities when we were working in sub-Saharan Africa and Uganda and in South Africa. 
Um, but in the communities where we re where we returned um, after three years, no major events had happened. Um, but it was really interesting to see the result. Um, the result was that there were many um, new indicators and many of the individual indicators were different. Um, a, a good percentage of them, around 70%, were, were different. But when we coded those indicators into categories um, with using the same code books and the same process, the result, was, the result that we saw was that the, the categories or the themes remained pretty much the same. Um, and so the way that people were identifying or measuring their piece may be changed, but the issue areas remain the same. Um, and your other question, the second question, um, had to do more with kind of like team structure, I think. Um, and so um, I, I basically, we don't send in any more really too many foreigners. <laughs> Um, the way that we work, um, that we have found most effective is um, we usually have um, facilitator teams where um, we have two facilitators from the capital city. So I'll just take the example of Colombia since that was the, the example that Naomi presented. So we have two Bogota based university educated facilitators, and then we hire local facilitators that um, partner with um, our Bogota based facilitators. So we have a man and a woman who's like sort of our permanent staff. Um, and then when we go to a region, we hire um, um, more um, a, a partner facilitator who is local, um, who knows the context. Um, who maybe has a lot of experience with facilitation through teaching or theater or whatever, um, uh, but maybe doesn't have the methodological knowledge that the university trained facilitator has. Um, and we find that very effective um, because uh, they work very well together um, and uh, really can draw on each other's strong points. Um, so, I, th I think that's your question, but, um, and maybe but, Naomi can yeah. add, she understood the question better. Well, I think that there was another layer to it and that has to do with language. Um, and I think that here I'm going to draw from my California project because it's, it's, it's something we're currently wrestling with. So we're trying to do a similar project, but in the city. Um, and we're, and we're defining community in, in, in different sorts of ways. And some of the, some of our communities are, geographic, like, you know, this, you know, four or five square block area, right? Um, and some of our, the communities we're working with are being de de, um, defined by um, ethnicity or race or language group. Um, and and it, Oakland, where we're doing this work right now, is incredibly diverse. And there are many different languages that are spoken. Um, and so one of the pro one of the groups that we really want to make sure to work with are um, are Asian immigrants. And nobody on our team <laughs> speaks Vietnamese or Cantonese. And so we're trying to figure out how can we we don't want to miss these important people who are members of this community, but we need to figure out how do we train bilingual folks to, to do the work with us. And so um, that, you know, the, 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 um, I think that the, um, the question you, you asked Alice really raises important methodological questions. Like how can you carry this out? And, and you don't want to just because of convenience drop whole people from, from the study. Um, but there's, but there also, you know, there, there's never a perfect way to do it. Um, and, and I think that one of, you know, when I, I, when I teach methods, one of the things I often say is you, you can never get it a hundred percent, right. You just have to do the best that you can, and then be really, really conscious of the biases that enter into your data collection through the choices that you make along the way. And so we haven't solved this question yet. I don't quite know what we're going to be doing in Oakland, but check back with me in six months and I'll tell you what I did. Thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank uh, you, Yes, actually, I have uh, three questions as well. Uh, but first, I would like to thank uh, you, uh, thank all the three of you for your intervention. It was really interesting. So the first two questions uh, are uh, addressed to uh, Professor Levy and Professor Fischel. And the last one will be addressed to the three uh, of you. So the first one, 
my first question is um, how uh, are your study uh, used in uh, in international organization or even by the country where they are uh, conducted uh, and do they receive a, a positive or, or a negative uh, response? And the second question uh, is uh, in your research for uh, a criteria uh, for assessing peace, did you ever thought to add uh, negative indicators of war uh, such as the criterion of the presence of a deficient state to have the upper level uh, of the bottom of, bottom of approach? And the last question, which is addressed to the, to the three panelists, to three professors, uh, is about the local uh, indicators uh, are really subjective, whereas the military expend expenditure are uh, more objective. Uh, would it be possible to combine both study to obtain uh, an almost perfect representation of, of peace? I mean, you, you wanted to say um, a negative criteria of peace, maybe? Yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, the negative criterion of, of war. I mean, okay. for, for uh, which question? The second one, right? Okay, yes. Oh, yes. A negative indicator uh, of war, such as the, the creator of uh, the present of uh, defi deficient state. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who wants to answer? I can start, Naomi. Or do you, are you? Um, you can you can go ahead and start. I I I, I have um, a lot to say about the first question. I think, um, especially because I've been thinking about it a lot in relation to this California project. But mm -hmm. but I, but um, okay. Um, so I I think that one of the things that that I mean, you know, this is my take on on EPI, and and Pamina might have a different view of it. But I think one of the things that we've been um, trying to do is figure out how do we feed all of these data that we get these incredibly rich data in to policy processes, right? And I think that in some of our contexts, we've done a we 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 have more um, more receptivity, and and that's that's the answer that I was I was thinking Pamina could could touch on a little bit. But I just want to briefly tell you a little bit about the California project because it is it is it, it, what's ex exciting about it is not just that it's it's a it's you know finally turning to the United States as one example of of these processes all around the world. I, America is too often treated as exceptional, and I don't think that it should be. Um, but I think the other reason why it's so exciting to me is because of the direct connection we have to policymakers. So in, in our project in California, we are um, sourcing to begin with indicators of safety to evaluate public safety reforms, like reforms in policing in the city of Oakland. Um, and we have through partners, direct connections to the policymakers themselves. And, and um, just recently in the last few months, the city of Oakland diverted some of their police funding to a department of violence prevention. Um, and, and those folks who, who suddenly now have $18 million that was going to go to the police and instead they get to use, they're really hungry for, for indicators that, that come much earlier in the causal process than, than something like the top-down indicators that usually get used to measure something like public safety, things like crime rates or homicide rates or recidivism, right? The, the, those sorts of measures all happen really far down the violence process. Um, whereas the indicators that we collect will be often are things like, are there children playing at the park, right? That, that's, that's a much, you know, much more proximate um, measure to the kinds of efforts that the violence interrupters and the violence preventers are going to be doing using um, the funds that they just got. Um, and so um, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, Tomas, but I, but I think one of the things that is so exciting to me about this California project is before we've even gone and sourced the indicators, we've established these relationships with the policymakers who are in interested in using them once they are sourced. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and let Pamina answer for more of the international work that we've done. Yeah, I mean, I can give an example um, from Sri Lanka uh, where um, we've been working now since 2018 um, and on an international peace building project. Um, we're embedded in USAID's reconciliation work in, in the country. Um, and um, what we um, are doing is uh, 
guiding USAID's implementation partner. So um, international donors typically don't implement projects themselves. They use um, international NGOs or companies to um, implement their work. And, um, and, and so what we're doing is we're guiding the implementing partner of USAID in this large peace building portfolio, <clears throat> portfolio that they have. Um, in, in terms of, um, in particular, in, in at, at a very local level, so at the in the communities where they work, um, and then um, we're also uh, using those indicators that we've um, used to guide the programming to monitor and evaluate um, the project work over time. Um, and this project is ongoing. Um, I think it's now. Um, still um, going to be going on until 2025, uh, 24, 25, I don't remember. Um, and so um, we are, you know, constantly um, engaging with uh, the partner. Um, and, um, and then the idea is that, you know, with the indicators and with the second round of indicators now that we're going to be collecting um, in early 2022, to also be able to uh, respond to questions surrounding the changes and how their um, programs and um, projects may uh, change after or should change after um, significant events have happened in the country. Um, and so we use um, both the indicators, I guess, to um, provide uh, guidance as well as to show um, how how the, the programming may maybe should change, um, as well as surveys in order to be able to see how um, change within those communities happens over time according to their own standards. Um, so hopefully that's helpful in um, understanding how we've how we've applied this um, more practically. Um, I guess uh, to your question of subjectivity and objectivity, I, um, I, I, like, I prefer to use the term internal versus external because um, I'm not sure I agree that necessarily, you know, one is subjective and one is objective. Um, and that's just my own personal um, perspective um, because uh, of obviously my epistemological standpoint, um, but uh, but definitely our indicators are internal um, versus uh, sort of the the more um, uh, expert led indicators are external. Um, and what is the relationship? I mean, first from my perspective, I mean I think they can work together. They both um, provide their own purposes. And um, we, so everyday indicators respond more to local needs, to local priorities, um, to understanding how um, every, what everyday people um, um, are concerned about um, and, um, and how they conceptualize these difficult to define concepts. Um, whereas external measures tend to speak more to um, donors or to the international community or to oftentimes, at least in the peace building world, liberal norms, right? Um, trying, to, um, um, trying to help us measure progress towards liberal peace goals. And, um, and so, so, so the, and that can be a good thing. Um, it can also be a bad thing, right? But I mean, it can be a good thing in the sense that um, it can demonstrate that um, and um, illustrate that tension between um, what we prioritize, the kinds of um, um, policies that we want to see implemented in post-conflict contexts. Um, the kinds of advancements we want to see, like, for example, women's rights, right? Um, versus what um, a village in Afghanistan wants to see and how it wants to see that um, materialize. Um, and, and so I think they can definitely work together and should work together. Um, and I mean, in terms of military spending, um, I don't know, maybe Diego has some 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 better ideas. 
Yes, so uh, thank you for your question. And I, I'm going to react to it because to actually answer it, I would need a lot more time to think about it. Um, it's a very uh, um, uh, complicated question, but I, I do like Pamina's division of internal and external. I, I that th that is a I, I think I tend to agree with that. But if I if I have to insist on your uh, division, Toma, uh, between objective and subjective, to the risk of undermining my my own work way, um, how objective can one be in anything when it comes to social sciences? Right, we of course. Objectivity and neutrality, that's really what CIPRI try, tries to stand for and, and, and stands for. But in a way, even, even the most simplistic definition uh, of or concept that one comes up with, uh, it has some sub subjectivity embedded to it. Uh, for instance, let me give you an example of military spending. Uh, uh, arguably, uh, or it's very reasonable to ask if the conception and definition of military spending that we do have fully captures the extent of military activities in developing countries. Um, perhaps there are other activities there, military related, that we are not considering because they are not that often, they're not that uh, common in developed countries. Um, that's one thing uh, that we can, we can ask. So even the most basic definition that is supposed to be very objective, uh, um, of course, the number, if I say 970, it's up 970, right? That's a number, at least the concept, it's a, we, we all understand. But um, the definition that highlighted that figure uh, in reality when we observe it, that has subjectivity in a way. Uh, of course, we try as much as we can to be objective, I think, at least from my standpoint, uh, my epistemological standpoint, um, that's something that we try. Of course, that's ideal. That's not something that we, we actually achieve. But in a, as a matter of principle uh, and, and, and the research, that's something that we try to take our sub subjectivity from it. That's a, a different, a more positivist stance when it comes to even if it's if it even if it's more cynical that in the point from the point of view that reality cannot be known fully but we try to in a way more like a stubborn people um so that's the, the i guess that that would be my 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 you know reaction to 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 your um to your question i guess um it's not fully your response but that's something that at least i, I you know reacting to your question yeah thank you so much I think we are coming at the end of this uh, round table. Uh, I really would like to thank you, all of you, for being so pedagogical uh, with our students, with everybody here, and so generous to share with us your, your works, your methods. Uh, it was very, it was fascinating. It was very, yes, great. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Valentina, do you want to add something? The most classic thing we heard in the last year and a half. Uh, so it was really a pleasure to have you. So I joined Sonia in thanking you all for this wonderful panel. Personally, as a lawyer, I learned a lot today and I always think how interesting it's to see the complementarity also and uh, multidisciplinary approach on common subject of studies. I find great also for our students, honestly. Um, so really a warm thank also on the side of, uh, I mean, also to the, to the audience that joined today. Um, Sonia, you want to launch for tomorrow morning? And yeah. Yes, just, just remember that tomorrow morning we have another round table uh, about Sahel, which kind of peace in Sahel. Uh, it's, a, it's a French uh, priority. Uh, so we talk a lot about Sahel and we will have with us uh, Nyagale Bagayoko. Uh, we'll have with us Baba Orfa Kornare and uh, Dauda Diaro who are all from uh, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and France, and we are talking together of the possibility of peace in the Sahel and in Mali, in particular. Um, and tomorrow afternoon, Valentina, you want to yeah, introduce? Tomorrow afternoon, we will work, uh, welcome Ratna Kapoor, Professor of International Law at Queen Mary University, London, and Harvard University. Uh, she's a, a wonderful scholar, feminist, post-colonialist, and we will discuss together the futurity of of human rights after critique seeking alternative registers of freedom this is the topic of the lecture tomorrow afternoon so of course everyone is welcome and uh, we continue the conversation tomorrow thanks again to thanks. our guest it was a great pleasure and uh, i hope we will have occasion to meet in person in the, in the near future i mean uh, when will be possible again
Thanks, Noemi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.